What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers. DJ, Rhett, Bucky, back with you as we go through week six of NFL action, which has got the league a little bit turned upside down. Whatever we thought we didn't know after three or four <laughs> weeks, I think we know less uh, now as we're through six Speak for weeks. yourself. Buddy. Yeah, Rhett's doing the gymnastics there in his head. Yeah, well, I do. Uh, I do speak for myself. Um, we're going to get things cranked up here, guys. Let's get to our big three uh, just to yeah. start it off. Uh, we've got uh, three incredible games here. We're going to go Ravens, Giants, Bills, Chiefs, Cowboys, Eagles. Let's start first, Rhett. Uh, Ravens, Giants. The Giants don't lose football games. I guess nobody in New York loses football games anymore. I, I don't know what the heck is going on. I'm trying to figure this thing out. Your take on this one here with the Giants. I mean, you know, I, I, I think it starts with just there's some really good coaching on that Giants staff. And it, and it starts with Brian Dable. And, and then obviously, I think Wink Martindale is one of the guys who we're kind of focused on in this game, having coming over from the Baltimore Ravens after spending a number of years there with John Harbaugh as his DC. And I feel like it was one of those narratives coming into the game like, well, okay, Wink Martindale knows Lamar Jackson, so he's going to know how to defend him. He's going he's to be so familiar with it. And it, in, in a way, even though, you know, the, the Ravens did accumulate a fair amount of yards, they have over 400 total yards, they rushed for over 200. But what they did do was keep the big plays out of the arsenal for Lamar through the passing game. In fact, for the fifth straight game, Lamar ends up with a sub-60 passer rating on deep throws. Yeah, he still found Mark Andrews for over 100 receiving yards. And again, they ran for over 200. But when Wink's defense needed it most, he was able to dial up some pressure. They were able to figure out a way to fluster Lamar. And then, you know, he makes a mistake, really, on that one play. The snap goes over his head. He picks it up, tries to make a bad play worse, throws it, gets picked off by Julian Love, who then returns it down and allows Saquon Barkley to run it in for what ended up being the game-winning touchdown. And then you get Kayvon Thibodeau coming off the edge, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, here when we get to the to our, our favorite rookies as well. But... Um, I just feel like that defense with Wink Martindale, they, they found a way to just keep that Ravens deep passing game out of sync. And so they were able to limit big plays and be in a position to win the game late with some big turnovers and some big pressure. Yeah, this is uh, interesting because the, the Giants are quickly becoming one of my favorite teams to watch, not necessarily because of their style, but just because of their resilience, how yeah. tough they are, how gritty they are, and how well coached they are. I think Brian Dayball, Wing Martindale, Mike Kafka have done a great job of uh, really playing complimentary football. I can't be forget my guy Thomas Mack, who does the special teams. They do a good job of playing off of one another, and whatever they need, they find a way to get it done. And so this is an effort where – Offensively, they couldn't get it going. 31 rushes, 83 rushing yards. Uh, Daniel Jones had less than 200 passing yards, but he had two touchdowns. But the one thing that the Giants aren't doing, they're not turning the ball over. And so yep. they're living by the creed, if we don't beat ourselves, we're going to win a lot of games. They're not beating themselves, and it's giving them an opportunity to win a ton of games. And they're cashing in 5-1 and one for the Giants. I don't think anybody even the most <laughs> optimistic Giants fan could have viewed this team being five and one at this stage and Brian Dayball's first season on the job yeah it's been incredible uh what coach Dayball's done with that group and Wink Martindale taking care of the defense as well I think you guys hit on some great points there uh Daniel Jones not turning the ball over had one fumble in this one but overall has done a nice job protecting the football those are all great points guys uh, to me, Saquon Barkley, though, let's give him some love as well. Definitely. This is somebody in this game, it's not going to, the stat sheet's not going to jump out at you. He had 83 yards on 22 carries, but they were tough, grimy yards. I think he's pressing the hole more than he ever has in the past. There's some opportunities where you see some of the, uh, the special traits that he has spinning spin out of a tackle. You see him press and bounce where he can do some of those magical things. But I thought overall, what a phenomenal job of getting some of those grimy, tough yards in this ball game from Saquon Barkley. And I think it kind of it typifies how this Giants team has played. There's a grittiness, there's a toughness to them. You see this run here at the end of the game, watch him going down, showing the awareness uh, to be able to keep the clock running and finish out the ball game. So overall, he's been, he's been the star of this offense. But I think if you're going to say who's the MVP of this team, um, I, you know, Buck, I'll get back to you on this one. MVP of this team, I think, is the head coach. Oh, I mean, Brian Dayball has instilled the confidence in this group. And, and to me, he's the coach of the year right now. 
Yeah, he was the right person for the job based on just what you heard about the culture in the locker room, in that building prior to. He has the ability to be light enough with the players where they really gravitate towards him. He has pop culture references. He's hip. He's cool. He's engaging <laughs> when it comes to communication. But he also understands how to impose discipline and how to get those guys to pay attention to the details. And so when you think about what this Giants team was a year ago, and then I hear Julian Love talk about it's a joy to go to work. It's a joy. Yeah to come back and play and to do these things that is the ultimate in terms of what you want the culture of your room to be you want everyone to come to work spend extra time but love being there this team is trending in the right direction and man they're so far ahead of the curve who knows how long they can keep it up but right now it looks good for the Giants no doubt uh all right Bill's Chiefs Thought this might be a shootout thought we might see 48 47 in this game it was not 24 20 the Bills they go on the road, they get to win over Chiefs. And Rhett, this is a game, we can talk about the game, but this, this has implications as we go towards the postseason. And there is a massive difference from having to play that game where these teams meet up again in Buffalo versus Kansas City. Yeah, you go back to the playoff game, you talk about a 20-possession game, half of those ending up in touchdowns combined, and zero turnovers, right? Well, this game featured a turnover in the red zone on each team's first offensive possession, so you kind of got the feeling it was going to be a little bit different uh, kind of going into this thing. The defenses definitely played a little bit better in this game, especially down the stretch. But one thing that remained the same, the difficulty of defending Stefan Diggs. He is so tough to deal with, and it almost reminds me of the way that it's so difficult to figure out a way to properly defend Travis Kelsey uh, in that connection with Patrick Mahomes. So he and Josh Allen have it rolling. I just it, there's they tried to defend Steph on a number of different ways, straight up man man coverage, had a bunch of different zone looks as well. You're watching one of them here where he kind of catches a corner out on a, a basically a smash concept in between the the corner and the safety. But like, when it's man coverage, they he beat you one on one. Like he'll beat you on a little whip route. He'll beat you. He'll turn five yards into ten yards with run after the catch. You want to play him in zone. They can scheme up some ways to beat you in zone. They'll they'll figure out some ways to get him free in man coverage as well. And the last third down conversion he had in this game was a third and two on that last drive they send him 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 in motion he lines up then outside of Dawson Knox who essentially shields the defender coming over uh, with the motion in man coverage and just allows a simple five yard out 10 yards easy conversion like they're scheming him open he gets open by himself and then the last part of it is the connection with Josh Allen like sometimes when he's covered sometimes when he when they're you know they, they they don't have the best route concept on Josh Allen's arm can beat you, right? And so when he knows where Stefan Diggs is going to be so often, and with that chemistry that they've developed over these last three years, like that part of the game, I mean, it's just there's no way to effectively defend that connection here. And the other thing about it, nine of ten of Stefan Diggs' catches in this game either went for first downs or a touchdown. That's big time ball. Yeah, that is big-time ball, and this was a huge game for the Buffalo Bills. This is one that they had certainly circled on the schedule. They wanted to make sure that they could get over the hump. They had to knock off the bully. They had to make sure they knocked off Kansas City so they could get home field advantage in the playoffs if it came to that, and they were able to do it. And I thought it was really telling in terms of the way they were able to do it on defense. This might have been the first time that we saw how the impact of Tyreek Hill's departure may change the way people play the Kansas City Chiefs in a big game. Didn't see as much too high safety. Saw them challenge their guys man-to-man. Thought they could go one-on-one. In the past, they hadn't necessarily been able to do that. Leslie Flazier still didn't bring a ton of pressure, but they were able to lock in, play some man, do some things where they could spy the quarterback. They weren't able to do that in the past because they always had to worry about number 10. I'm not saying that, look, the Chiefs can't get by without Tyreek Hill. I'm just saying in a battle of heavyweights, particularly against the Buffalo Bills, it becomes a more difficult deal, and you have to kind of attack them a little differently. The thing that I've noticed is there, there used to be uh, plays with Kansas City where they would not only get home runs, but they were easy home runs. They were mm-hmm. uncovered. They were shot plays, yeah. and you kind of set things up and pay it off. Even like some of these explosives that they did have in this game, which there were a handful of, of pass plays over 20 yards, it was Mahomes throwing into crazy tight windows, making some unbelievable throws. I just think it's it's not that this team can't be explosive and this team can't you know eventually put up a bunch of points. It's to me, guys, it just looks so much harder than it's been in the past. And I think that's the Tyreek Hill effect. And 
you know, you can look at the box score and you can see some explosives in there. You can see Juju going over 100, Travis Kelsey going over 100. But Buck, I don't know where you are on this, but when I watched this ball game, I got a chance to sit down on the couch on a Sunday that didn't have a game, uh, was able to just watch this thing live. You, it doesn't feel the same. You know, it just doesn't. It doesn't look like it comes as easy as it has in the past. No, it certainly doesn't come in easy. And I thought they would be a little more of a half-court basketball team where they had to really use all of the pieces. And it wouldn't be the explosive outfit that we've seen the last three, four, five years. But it is – a little harder than I anticipated. I thought they would lean into the running game. I thought that would kind of lead to some bigger plays, off play action and the like. They haven't been able to do that just yet. And so the good thing about this is it's an early season matchup. So Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy and that offensive staff would be able to go back into the lab and look at what they need to do to be able to get past the Buffalo Bills. Because the one thing that we do know these teams are headed on a collision course. They're going to have to meet again. This was kind of like the preview to what will be and what should be and what we hope yes. to be a title game matchup where we see two of the best teams in football duke it out to go to the Super Bowl. Well, speaking of rematches that we could see down the road, we know we're going to see one in the NFC East. This was the oh, first yeah. meeting between the Cowboys and the Eagles. This was Cooper Rush, not Dak Prescott. This was the Eagles remaining undefeated 6-0. and uh, they handled the Dallas Cowboys. Rhett, uh, what did you learn from this game? And let's let's look forward a little bit to when they're going to meet again down the road, how different it is just with the change at quarterback. Well, and, th and that's the thing. Like, I think you'll leave this game as a Cowboys fan saying, okay, next time we play this team with Dak Prescott, given that he remains healthy and is available moving forward, I feel pretty good about our opportunity to be in this game from the jump and throughout, you know, all 60 minutes, right? The way they came back in the second half, certainly a valiant effort. Thought the run game was pretty good. Zeke over six a carry. Uh, Michael Parsons got started slow, but did kind of come on once Lane Johnson left the game. But look, I think the thing that we need to do with this is, is talk about Cooper Rush and give him his credit for what he had done in Dak's absence up to this point, which was go, essentially go undefeated, right? But here's the thing. There, there's generally a reason why a quarterback like that is not starting somewhere uh, on a big money deal, right? I mean, he just does not have necessarily the skill set that the starter has. I mean, it's just obvious. There's a reason he's a QB, too. There's a reason, um, you know, that, that he's not out there for another club starting somewhere. And, and I think that that's basically what you saw here was an expiration date on, on Cooper Rush. And I, I think I, I kind of go back to – you guys remember when Brandon Whedon was playing in the league uh, and yeah. had a couple of – a couple of those opportunities where he'd come in for an injured starter and, man, he'd light it up, throw it all over the yard. You know, they'd either win the game or get really close, and then he'd have to start the next week and it'd be a train wreck um, most of the time. I feel like Cooper Rush, I mean, much better in that respect and that he was able to win four games this season, just not, not quite enough. Look, the arm talent's different. I think there was a number of throws here where he was late and the ball just didn't have the zip to get out there to where he wanted it to go. I remember watching, sitting there watching a couple of those throws, one to Michael Gallup in particular on basically a 12-yard hook route on the perimeter. I'm just like, all right, is that thing going to get there? And ultimately, it didn't. That was a reason why he had two interceptions in the first half. And he did have some good throws in this game. I think just ultimately not enough. And this offense will be way more dynamic with Dak Prescott out there. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's what Cowboys fans should latch on to, is that they were in this game in the second half, and that with Dak back, they're going to have an opportunity uh, to give a better game to the Eagles. Yeah, Red, a lot of the attention will be on the, the clock striking midnight on Cooper Rush. Yeah. Like it was a nice story, it was a nice little fairy tale, but at some point you knew he was going to come back to earth. I think the bigger thing is the Philadelphia Eagles and how the Philadelphia Eagles control the trenches when they want to control the trenches, meaning when the game got tight, the Philadelphia Eagles did what I watched them do to my Jaguars up close and personal. They ran the football down the Dallas Cowboys' throat for that clinching drive. And so when they want to play what we call big boy football and they want to run it down your throat, they certainly have that club in their bag. And so sometimes we'll talk about Jalen Hurts and them passing to the weapons outside, and that is a, a, a requisite for this team to get to the next level. But the one thing that we do know, when it gets tough for the Philadelphia Eagles, they can line up and they can just run the football at you. And to me, yeah. That is their superpower, and it's one of the reasons why this team is for real as a Super Bowl contender. Yeah, to me, you guys, when I look at, at the Philadelphia Eagles, to me, a guy that needs to get a little love is Brandon Graham. Uh, this is a sure. veteran for them that was huge in their Super Bowl run. They talked about it on the broadcast. But you watch him week in and week out. He gives you power rush. Um, he collapses the pocket. 
His effort is contagious. They roll guys through. They've got a deep group there. Uh, but to me, he's one of the more underappreciated pass rushers in this league and has been for some time. That was a big hit. Ended up being an interception. Uh, helped create a turnover. But he just kind of wears tackles out. I, I think of you know an offensive line having that cumulative effect of wearing people out. I think this defensive line can do some of those same things with the wave of guys they throw at you. I thought they kind of wore down this Cowboys offensive line. And another thing I would add here uh, as we go to break, guys, is, man, Landon Johnson, we got it. We got an idea of just how valuable he is when he went out of that game. Uh, La sorry, Lane Johnson. When Lane Johnson went out yeah. of that game, you saw you know them struggle a little bit mm -hmm. with Micah Parsons there on the edge. So uh, I, hopefully to get him DJ, back I, and, and I, they'll be okay. That, that little ahead, Freudian right. slip there, I kind of like it. That's like, that's like the right guard, right tackle combo, right? Landon Dickerson and Lane Johnson. Yeah, I know. They're, they're like right next to each other. They're right, they're right <laughs> next to each other. That's not fair. It's not fair at all. Um, all right, uh, we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back. We're going to get into eight things we learned from week number six. NFL Plus is the league's new exclusive video streaming subscription service. NFL Plus has your game day covered with live, local, and primetime regular season and postseason games right on your phone or tablet. NFL Plus is available in the NFL app and on NFL.com. Subscription plans start at just $4.99 a month. Fans can visit plus.nfl.com and sign up for a free trial of NFL Plus today. All right, it's time for the grade eight. We're going to go, sorry, elite eight. I always screw that up. Uh, the elite eight. Eight things that uh, <laughs> that we can take away here from week number six. Rhett always chuckles when I do that. Every we week still I love can you. count on me screwing yeah. that oh, up. You're not a Rhett, host. What do you want to do? Rhett just give me the business. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, I feel it. I play one. On, I, I play one on fast. Uh, That's right. Go. Let's go. Um, so let's start us off here. I'll go first one here. Let's go to the Packers. I got a chance to watch this whole game live on on uh, on TV. Then I went back and watched the tape. And, uh, you know, Bucky, I want to get to you on this point, because when I watched it, there are no difference makers on this group. When you watch them, we used to always talk about creating advanced scouting reports as you're watching Sauce Gardner just swallow uh, mm -hmm. these Packer receivers. Romeo Dobbs couldn't get away from him. But when we when we would do advanced reports when we were scouting, you would always circle the guys or highlight them, put them in a different color. But these are the guys you have to take away. I, who is that guy? I don't even know who that guy is for the Green Bay Packers, Buck. Yeah, no, I, this is the thing with the Green Bay Packers. Uh, the lack of difference makers really stands out. It stands out because the quarterback is regressing. I know we don't want to say that, four-time MVP, but he's not the same guy anymore. And so as he gets older, he needs more support around him. And right now they're not getting that, particularly because they're not running the football effectively and the defense isn't playing lights out. I am worried. I am worried about the Green Bay Packers. All right, what's your, what's your takeaway here? What we got next, Buck? Oh, man, the Dirty Birds. The Falcons are scrappy. I didn't know that my guy, my fellow Tar here, Arthur Smith, would able to be able to build a bully in Atlanta, but that's what he's doing. The Atlanta Falcons took one of the best defenses in football, took him to the shed, ran it all up and down the field, 168 rushing yards. And, man, they did it with a variety of guys, a hodgepodge of guys, even Marcus Mariota getting into the party. And what I really liked about it, I think some people can appreciate it. I can't appreciate it because I don't like beer. After the game, Arthur Smith took him up to the club suite, took the <laughs> offensive <laughs> line up to the club suite, and treated him to a couple brews. He said, we beat him up, then we drink and celebrate. I like that. I like what Arthur Smith is doing it. Treat the offensive lineman, to borrow uh, a phrase from uh, Arkansas head coach Sam Pittman, smoke cold beer. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, especially after he was mic'd up. Uh, you probably heard the, the previous week, I'm going to run the you-know-what out of the ball, and they did. And uh, so that was certainly fun uh, to watch. And I just loved seeing um, Kyle Pitts score a touchdown when everybody had already benched him in fantasy. So, um, got, finally got that rolling, uh, as you might expect. All right, I'm going to move us team. I know, man. Mine too. It's been tough. It's been tough. Uh, I'm going to move us on to another game. And actually, both of my takeaways here, both the things that I learned in, uh, from week six are coming from this game, which was not the prettiest. Seahawks hosting the Cardinals. I'll start with the Seahawks and the positives. It's going to be a heck of a rookie class for John Schneider and Pete Carroll and this crew. Um, obviously, they've been starting a pair of rookie tackles for much of this season. And how about Kenneth Walker? Looking like K-9 that was uh, on a Heisman Trophy campaign for the Michigan State Spartans uh, a year ago. And man, he has filled in nicely for Rashad Penny. It might end up giving him a bit of a lift uh, as well in the run game. Had a touchdown. In fact, the only touchdown from either team in this game. He's got some serious burst and explosion. Um, as well once he gets past that first level of defenders. And then you look on the defensive side of the ball, Kobe Bryant 
and Tariq Woolen are making plays all over the place for the Seattle Seahawks. I want to go back to what they did in week six. Combined for 13 tackles. Both got their hand on a football uh, in terms of a pass defense. Pick for Tariq Woolen was his fourth. Mm -hmm. And he now has won in four consecutive games. Just the third rookie DB to do that since 2000. And the last to have four picks in his first six games was another Seattle Seahawks rookie. Back in that Legion of Boom days, Earl Thomas uh, had four in his first six games as well. So Tariq Woolen is turning out to be a heck of a player. The converted wide receiver, kind of similar to what Richard Sherman was, coming out as a big corner converted wide receiver out of Stanford. Kobe Bryant. Boy, Mafe has a sack on the season, too. This is going to be a perhaps a real building block, almost like when we look back at what the Saints did a few years ago with that Camara class, Ryan Ramchek, Marshawn Lattimore. This might be that type of class for the Seattle Seahawks. Yeah, and Tariq Woolen, guys, got a chance to be the defensive rookie of the year with the numbers he's putting up. Six, yes. 4 two, ten. Talk about the comparison to, to Richard Sherman. Fifth-round pick, too, after right. running as fast as he did. There was some tightness. We talked about that in the run-up to the yeah. draft, but the way they're using him, the way they're playing him, has not it been works. an issue at all. We know he is long. As a former receiver, he can find and play the ball, and he's Richard Sherman plus just in terms of the speed. This is like a difference between a high 4-2 uh, versus, <laughs> versus Richard Sherman, who is a great player, but didn't have that yeah. type of juice. No. Uh, so Tariq Woolen, unbelievable start for him. Uh, all right, I'm going to keep it going here. Let's go to Tua. I know Tua hasn't played, but maybe that's the best thing for him because we've always kind of wondered, is Tua any good? And then all of a sudden they put some speed around him, some playmakers around him, and Tua starts playing great. And then you hear, ah, oh, well, it's, you know, it's not really Tua. It's the guys that they have around him, and it's this unbelievable play caller that they have. Well, you've seen life without him now. And some of the things that Tua does that go underappreciated, I think a lot of quarterbacks do these things and go underappreciated, is get the ball out on time, protect the football, football make good decisions, be efficient. And I feel like sometimes, Buck, we talked about the things that Tua wasn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we appreciated the things that he was. And I think him not being in the lineup and them seeing what life looks like without him, I think there's a healthy appreciation for the way Tua plays the game. Absolutely. I think everyone is seeing that uh, just in following Twitter and looking at all the Dolphins fans and what they're talking about. Yeah, there's a greater appreciation for Tua Tagovailoa after seeing what it looks like without him. And we talked about with Tua, it's a little bit of the Alabama offense, surrounded with big-time playmakers, let him be a pass-first point guard. That is how he played it. And that's why we made the comparisons to a Drew Brees when he was coming out. And so it's interesting. We'll see how it plays out. But let's go to the other part of that. Uh, the Vikings, sneaky contender because they are a well-balanced outfit. I don't even think they brought their A game against the Miami Dolphins, but they were able to somehow win it. Dalvin Cook didn't have over 100 yards. Kirk Cousins was right below 200. But, ooh, that Justin Jefferson showed up and had a 100-yard game. Their defense continues to make plays. And you just look up, and Kevin O'Connell has his team winning games. This team couldn't win these games the last couple years. They couldn't win the close games. They would fall apart somehow at the end. They are making the plays needed to just put the dub in the column. And if they keep stacking these wins with the Packers struggling and the rest of the division not quite up to par, the Minnesota Vikings are going to win the division. And they may have a nice seed getting ready for a deep playoff run. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to, to note that it didn't take a ridiculous game from Justin Jefferson to go win this thing, mm -hmm. right? They were able to get Herb Smith into the end zone, which I think could be a real interesting piece to this offense uh, moving forward as well. Young tight end there um, kind of stepping into a bigger role perhaps in these uh, in these next few games. So that'll be another part of this thing that's interesting to watch. I'm going to move back to that Seattle Cardinals game here, and I want to ask you both a question. What is the Cardinals' offensive identity? I'll wait. <laughs> Good luck. I don't oh, know. <laughs> let's see. We can go a couple things, Buck. Let's go a couple of them. Okay. Uh, Buck likes spread and shred uh, when it's at its best. <laughs> Chuck and duck when it's not. So that's uh, it's flip a coin, uh, whatever you want to call I, that. I'm serious. Like, what what can you say? Like, it just feels like it's it's all disjointed. They're out of rhythm. Like, there's just no consistency with the way that they really attack defenses, it feels like. And obviously, they've been shorthanded. No James Conner, and they haven't had DeAndre Hopkins all season long, obviously, with the six-game suspension. But he is eligible to come back uh, in this next week for the Cardinals. Maybe that has been the missing piece to finding some real rhythm offensively and, and, and being able to make a play when Kyler Murray doesn't have to try to, you know, elude the rush and, and, you know, juke three guys out of his socks for a 20-yard run or scramble and throw because that's really been what they've had to rely on for the most part in, in these games. And this is the second time this season, guys, that they have played a game in which they have not scored a touchdown. 
mm-hmm. on offense. So I, I just think that it, it feels lost. Maybe they can still find it, though, with DeAndre coming back and now that they have traded for Robbie Anderson, mm-hmm. uh, who was one of the storylines of this week for the wrong reasons, essentially sent off the sidelines from interim head coach there in Carolina, Steve Wilkes, uh, after having some, looked like some verbal altercations with some assistant coaches on the sidelines. So now Robbie on his way to Arizona, all is Marquise Brown. And I missed this actually watching this game that Marquise Brown got hurt on the very last offensive play for Arizona and was seen leaving the game in a walking boot. So maybe that's why they needed to go get Robbie Anderson and they get DeAndre Hopkins back. Uh, maybe they can salvage this thing. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see. It's it's not easy to watch, but those are some major additions, especially with D-Hop when you get him back in sure. there and see if they can't find something. He, he has a way of making some some play calls he look does. good. Uh, I want to get to the game Bucky was at, Jags, Colts. And if you'd have told me, after watching what the Jags did to the Chargers and seeing that up close and personal, what that pass rush can look like when they get heated up and gassed up, and you told me they're going to play the Colts team, the Colts are not going to have Jonathan Taylor. The Colts are going to throw the ball 58 times after what I've seen of this Colts offensive line. Now, they made some changes up front. I would have thought the Colts going to get destroyed by this Jacksonville front, but yet they, they had a clean sheet, Buck. They didn't give up any sacks on 58 pass attempts, and lo and behold, Matt Ryan looked like he was good again. Yeah, no, it was interesting to watch up close and personal because they came out with a game plan that the Jaguars certainly weren't prepared for. Throwing early and often, operating up-tempo. I mean, Matty Ice turned back the clock a little bit. And even though his physical skills have started to dimin- diminish, man, his intelligence, his awareness was able to really give the Jaguars problem. And this hodgepodge of collection of talent that they have at the offensive line, I don't know how good they are, but when you have a quarterback who understands how to get the ball out of his hands, yeah. he certainly protected them. And, oh, by the way, Alex Pierce might be a real dude because he took Shaquille Griffin yeah. to the shed. And it was problem. <laughs> it was a big problem. He couldn't cover him. He had a couple of PIs. And so the Colts have stumbled and bumbled a little bit without their main players being available. Remember, this is a team that we talked about having real playoff chances and being in the mix. They still have plenty of time to turn it around because they're sitting at 3 2 and 1. They haven't even played their best ball yet. Uh, it's true. It's true. Um, and again, uh, playing some young players on the offensive line, seeing some good things there. Uh, what's the final? What's number eight on the takeaway list, Buck? Hey, man, you know, we talk about it being a week to week league. The Pittsburgh Steelers looked terrible a week ago. And lo and behold, they go to Tampa Bay, and they just absolutely throttle Tom Brady and company. And I can't really explain it. Um, the, I, I'm sitting here looking at the Pittsburgh Steelers' defense. They're able to hold them to 300 yards, only 18 points. Um, it's the first win they've had without T.J. Watt. Offensively, Kenny Pickett starts. He goes out. Mitchell Jabisky comes in and is aggressive and dealing and finding Chase Claypool, and they're making all these plays. And you just look, and you turn off the click, and you're like – what did I just see? <laughs> Who is this team that Where did they a week from? ago couldn't get a first down, couldn't move, looked terrible, and this team plays and shows up? I don't know, man. I just know from a week-to-week basis, I have no idea what I'm going to see whenever we turn on the TV and watch the tape. It, it is crazy to watch. But Pittsburgh bounce back. Well, I think we learned. You don't want to mess with Mad Mitch. You get Mitch a little mad, you got problems. And that's uh, that's what happened there. I feel like, by the way, this was a North Carolina-themed uh, show thus far. A lot of Arthur Smith love, some Mitchell uh, I mean, Trubisky love. I mean, we got, the, mean, we got the victory bell back, too. We beat Duke, got the victory bell, had the chrome domes on. Like, we're ranked. Now we're talking. Everything is, everything is trending up in Tar Heel land. There we go. There Except we go. when you get to um, Assembly Hall. Uh, not turning up for the Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> it's story. football season. Oh, it's football season. Yeah. Uh, that's right. All right. Okay. Okay. I got you. That's fair. Uh, all right. We're going to take a break. We're going to be back with our standout rookies and favorite performances of week six right after this. Cancer screening can help prevent and detect a number of cancers early, which often means less intense and more successful treatment. If you don't know where you can get screened, the NFL and the American Cancer Society can help. Visit nfl.com slash crucial catch or text catch, C-A-T-C-H, to 635-635 to find your local cancer screening center and additional screening resources. All right, guys, time for our rookies here. We do stand out rookies each and every Monday, and I feel like I'm on repeat because I usually just grab a Jets rookie because I know some Jets rookie is going to do something big. 
Um, and not the first time I've gone to their running back in Brees Hall. We said a few weeks ago he's due to break out, and mm -hmm. we've seen that over the last several games now. He has become the focal point of their offense. And to me, if you, if you ask me who the best two players are on the Jets, we're going to get to their defensive line a little bit. Uh, Quinn and Williams, the best player on this team. This is the second best player right now, Brees Hall. He, he is ready to be a star in this league and emerge as potentially the best running back in the entire league. He's got that type of ability. He pops a little trap for a touchdown. Um, he's got bursts to get to the perimeter, as you see here. He finishes runs. He's an asset in the passing game, which we saw in Pittsburgh previously. But 160, 116 yards on the ground against the Packers. Uh, Buck, he was outstanding. He's outstanding. He's the same player that he looked like he was going to be at a Iowa State. He's just smooth and crafty. He does a good job of finding those creases, and the Jets have really given him more responsibility. And because of that, their offense is beginning to flourish. I'm going to go and stick in New York. Let's go Kayvon Thibodeau coming off the edge. He's a one-trick pony in terms of being a speed rusher, but, man, that trick is really nice. And he was able to get a strip sack to close the game out against Lamar Jackson and the Ravens. And when we think about the New York Giants and the success that they've always had traditionally throughout this franchise's history, it has been when they've been able to dominate up front with the pass rush. I now am beginning to see Big Blue come back and get all their pieces back. Kayvon Thibodeau to go with Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams and Aziz Ojolari. This is a dangerous team. Kayvon Thibodeau is one of those guys who has that pass rush ability to be a closer. We saw him close out the game against the Ravens on Sunday. Yeah, Dex with a sack as well uh, in this game. And, and look, I think, um, you know, we talked about it kind of, a, you know, quite a bit when we were evaluating Kayvon Thibodeau coming into the into the draft, you know, what does football mean to him? Um, you know, like where, what are the priorities? And that was one of those kind of unfortunate storylines that was surrounding him. I don't know if you, you saw him emotional yeah. walking off the field. Um, if you don't think that making an impact for this team and being an impact player, um, you know, for this franchise means something to that guy uh, after being sidelined with an injury for the first few weeks and then starting to get his legs under him again, uh, I think you're sadly mistaken. And uh, and so I think the, the Giants hit a home run there. And again, another one of those rookie classes. By the way, Wandale Robinson getting into the end zone too, providing a little extra boost um, there for that passing game that's been void of wide receiver help. Uh, I'm going to move on to another rookie here, guys. Bailey Zappi. I mean, uh, for the second straight year, a rookie quarterback has impressed us at times for the New England Patriots. Last year it was Mac Jones. This year now with Mac injured, Bailey Zappi, and I know we don't get too big on, on stats here in, in, in terms of what it means historically, but Bailey becomes the first rookie to win each of his first two career starts with a 100-plus passer rating in both games since Sonny Jurgensen in 1957. So I, I just I, I think it's been really fun to watch how comfortable he looks back there. And, and look, let's not you know let's not uh, downgrade the fact that he's playing against a, a Browns defense has some pretty dang good players over there. I know Denzel Ward didn't play mm -hmm. and Jadavian Clowney didn't play, but Miles Garrett's still out there. Greg Newsom's still out there. I mean, like there's some guys that can make some plays defensively. And Zappy was just dealing all day long. He now has twice as many touchdowns as Mac Jones and four fewer interceptions. Is that fair, though? Is it fair to just talk about Bailey's success without mentioning the fact that the New England offense was an absolute train wreck in the po in the preseason, in training mm -hmm. camp, and through the first few weeks of this season? And one of those historical trademarks of a Belichick coach team is getting better each week. And is Zappi just a product of them figuring it out on offense, simplifying it a little bit? Uh, would Mac have had the same success? Hard to say, but Bailey's playing – at so well that Belichick, you know, when asked about the quarterback situation, was like, well, we'll just have to see how that process plays out. Wow. I, I don't know what to expect. Well, interesting. Forward. Last year, remember, remember we did rookie report cards last year, and mm -hmm. every yeah. every week, Rhett would give Mac Jones an A. Yeah. And I'm beginning to think, maybe that's just an easy class in New England. Yes. You know, maybe it's just an easy yes. class, and that's why those grades are so good. Uh, Bailey Zappi has been outstanding. All right, let's get yeah. to favorite performances of the veteran route here. I'll lead us off. Allen Robinson for the Rams. It was nice to see him get going a little bit. And going back and watching all his targets, guys, I feel like he's not the, the traditional fit in the McVay system. You think about all their wideouts kind of look the same and, and kind of, you know, they're interchangeable and they're pristine route runners and in and out of breaks. To me, Allen Robinson can do some of those things, but I think he's at his best playing kind of big boy football. Mm -hmm. He gets a goal line fade. He gets a back shoulder fade, which you see right here on the screen, using his size to post guys up, work back to the quarterback. Um, to me, they're figuring out how to use him. And I, I think that's a process when you bring in somebody, even though they're talented, 
Um, you got to take some time to get your feet wet and figure out how do we fit him into what we do. And we have to change a little bit of what we do for Allen Robinson. I, I give him a lot of credit for being patient. I give Sean McVay credit for figuring out uh, what to do with him, Buck. It was nice to see him get going a little bit. Yeah, it was nice to see him get going. They needed him to get going because this has been too much of a Cooper Cup show. And I love Cooper Cup, but you can't just remember one guy catching all the passes in the passing game. You got to have some some balance. You got to make the defense deal with some of the other weapons on the outside so they finally were able to do that i'm gonna go back to atlanta and continue to talk about the falcons and marcus mariota yes. marcus mariota like i didn't know how this was going to work because in my mind i'm still thinking marcus mariota was ultimately benched by arthur smith in tennessee like do they really have this connection but marcus mariota has been terrific man he completed the first 12 passes did a great job of just managing the game but he has kind of leaned into the athleticism that I always felt like early in his career he was reluctant to use. 50 yards on the ground enhances an already potent rushing attack, even though they don't have name brands in terms of that running back. Collectively, this is a dominant rush offense, number three in the league running the football. Marcus Mariota is a nice complimented quarterback, can throw it a little, can run a little, manages the team. That's why the Falcons are a big surprise this year. Yeah, and uh, I do want to go back, and I love what love the, love what the Falcons have been able to do uh, to kind of figure out a way to get a couple of wins and grind out some wins for sure. But I want to go back to the Rams here for a second um, because not just have they started to find a way to get Allen Robinson uh, involved, DJ, but how about manufacturing run game? They had eight different ball no. carriers. Eight different. They had more. They had just as many guys with a rushing attempt, and although Matthew Stafford's were knees, but still seven different guys with true rushing attempts. Like they're trying to get as creative as possible to figure out ways to move the football down the field. And I, I think I, again, that's that's a credit to what they do um, from a staff perspective offensively as well. All right, I'm going to get to my standout. It was a guy who I kind of called that, not necessarily called out, but called out for uh, just not being what he what he had been a year ago for his team. That was Jamar Chase with the Cincinnati. Cincinnati Bengals felt like they were missing that explosive element uh, with Chase in the pass game. Boy, did they find it down the Superdome. And well, I, I guess when your starting quarterback wears uh, the, the number one wide receivers national championship jersey into the stadium in which they won a national title together, you better expect a pretty big game. And that was the case for Jamar Chase. While he did not have 221 receiving yards like he did in that 2019 national title game in the Superdome, he did go for 132 and two touchdowns, one of which was a 60-yard catch and run showcasing that physicality that he has at the wide receiver spot to make guys miss, to run through tackles. He did that with Bradley Roby and Tyron Matthew uh, giving chase, and that ended up being uh, the game-winning touchdown for the Cincinnati Bengals on the road. I think for them, for the Bengals to really find their consistent rhythm offensively, you got to find a way to get the ball to Jamar Chase and let him into some of those situations where he can make guys miss and get those explosive plays down the field. Yeah, also, you still get six catches uh, from uh, from T. Higgins. You get six catches yeah. from Tyler Boyd. So, Doesn't mean the uh, other guys nice, can't a nice be a part way of it. Spreading the ball around there. Right. Yep. No, absolutely. But he provides some of that punch with the big plays, a 60 yard reception. Um, okay, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to look at this Jets defensive line, which has emerged as one of the best in the league and absolutely obliterated the Green Bay Packers offensive line. We'll do that right after the break. It's time for Battle at the Line, presented by Caesars Sportsbook. And we talked a little bit earlier about the Green Bay Packers not having a you know a big time marquee weapon that you have to worry about. I know one thing: uh, the Jets were not concerned with them. Uh, their secondary held up very well, played great. Sauce Gardner, DJ Reed, and company. But this game, man, this was dominated by the front of the Jets. Quentin Williams, guys, was the best player on the field. Uh, completely dominant, but it's not just him. You see Bryce Huff with pressures. You see Sheldon Rankins running games and twists inside. John Franklin Myers uh, getting some heat. Carl Lawson getting heat off the edge. This was a group that, to me, is is really kind of emerged as one of the best in the league. I mean, that was Quinnen Williams. That was He was as impressive, Buck, as anybody in the league yesterday, the way he dominated the interior of that line. He was not alone. That is a good group. 
Yeah, it is a good group. I think Robert Sala referred to him as a bowling ball of butcher knives. I've never seen a bowling ball with butcher knives, but I would assume that that would be very dangerous to deal with as we're getting close to Halloween. So I don't want that to come in my neighborhood. But this is what I'll say about that defensive line. That defensive line is outstanding, and they control the line of scrimmage. And much like Robert Sala was able to do in San Francisco with that group that he had, he's able to control the game at the line of scrimmage. Quinn Williams, five tackles, two sacks, three quarterback hits, always in and around it. Also blocked a, a field goal. Let's do his third overall pick in the draft because we thought he had dominant potential. Now he's living up to some of those expectations. And if he plays like this, oh, the Jets are going to be a nightmare to deal with at the point of attack. Yeah, and, and look, I think it, it does kind of go hand in hand, DJ, with your earlier point about the Green Bay Packers, right? You're not scared of anybody yeah. out there, right? So you saw the Jets no. were able to utilize the single high safety a uh, majority of their, uh, uh, you know, the majority of their coverages in this game. So you can, you know, you can do that. You don't have to get that second safety uh, up into the box or, or back deep. You can have him, you know, play a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage and cause some havoc out there. Sheldon Rankins, you know, played well in this game too. It wasn't just Quentin Ooh. Williams. Mm -hmm. Um Man, I mean, it just feels like they can come at you from so many different ways. And I don't even know if we've really started to see the, the Jermaine Johnson effect yet either. So I think there's still some some room for this team to grow defensively. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah, he's he, and he was playing well early in the year, especially against the run. John Franklin right. Myers, another one who's who's a really, really good player. So uh, they get Vinnie Curry. They got him back. Again, I look around in the league, and I know a bunch was made earlier in the season mm -hmm. because the Jets had come out and said, look, we're going to try and keep Quinn and Williams fresh. Uh, we're not going to try and overload any of these guys. We're going to roll guys yeah. through. And I know some people say, oh, you keep your best guys out there. But this is kind of the way, the mm -hmm. San Francisco way, when they were rolling, when Sala was there, he saw it, having waves of guys to roll through there. Yeah. And they throw different pitches, man. You got to deal with some quickness with one guy. The next guy comes out there. Clemens comes out there. They're rookie. He just wants to put his hands in your chest and take <laughs> you right back to the quarterback, right? <laughs> well, that and, and I don't even I don't think the 49ers had a, had a cornerback during Salah's run there as good as Sauce Gardner has been mm -mm. Uh, early on, and as good as he can no. be. So I mean, like that gives it just another element, right? That you can just trust that guy out on an island right now if you really have to, especially you know when the receiving core isn't isn't quite up to snuff. Yeah, no, the 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 yeah, combination. The combination is really working. The pass rush, the coverage, they're doing all those things. And if they're able to run the football like they've been able to run it, that is a recipe for success for the Jets. Yeah, it was uh, John Runyon and Royce Newman inside. They did not want to see any more of uh, number 95. I can promise you that. There was one, I think we might even have showed it on the clip, where he, he gets so – he Quinn and turns his shoulders and the guy is just trying to box him out. He's literally got his back to him, just like, please, just whatever I got to do, try and slow this dude down if I can't How do, do I get it this rebound? Side. I'm going to try and do it on the backside. Yeah, see if I can box him out and get a rebound. Good call. Uh, anyways, hats off to the Jets. They are 4-2. and two. The Giants are 5-1, and one. man. New York football. Who knew? Uh, anyways, this has been a fun show, a wild week uh, in the NFL. It's been great to hang with you guys. we got a couple more uh, episodes coming your way this week. Remember, you can find all the Move the Sticks content, NFL's YouTube, NFL.com, the NFL channel, and the NFL app. We appreciate you guys hanging with us here on Move the Sticks, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers.